So good afternoon and welcome to Interfaith Insights, a very festive edition, as you can see. And we are live on the Edinburgh Interfaith Facebook page. And as always, you can catch up more episodes on the Edinburgh Interfaith Facebook page and online on our YouTube channel. And remember, follow us on Edinburgh Interfaith. As always, I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Nassim and Joe. Uh, how are you both today? Very well, very well. Very well, thank you. You have a, a mug of something nice there, Joe? Well, a uh, little uh, builder's tea, but it's brisk outside, so we need a little builder's tea. We do indeed. Now, last week's Interfaith Insights was replaced by a, a wonderful new show called Spirit Up. Uh, and uh, a new Interfaith cooking show provides a window into different faiths and their cultures and how they cook at home. And Rokshana, in last week's episodes, was teaching us how to make chickpea curry and koftas. And wonderfully, on the last night of Hanukkah, uh, Jo, your good, your good wife, Nancy, was showing us how to make potato lat cakes. Uh, and if you didn't see those episodes, do catch up on, on, on the Facebook. It was, it was wonderfully entertaining and uh, just educational at the same time. It was great. Now, obviously, at uh, this time of year, it is a very uh, important time in many different faith traditions. Obviously, for Christians, we are approaching uh, Christmas and Judaism. You've just had uh, Hanukkah. And for Hindus and Sikhs, obviously, the end of Diwali, uh, Bandi Shore has just passed recently. The pagan community have had you. So it's a very uh, important time of year, uh, symbolizing you know hope and, and really light uh, in dark times. And I think we need... We need certainly hope and light in the dark times that we're in just now. Uh, and today, hopefully, we will be spreading a little bit more light when we hear about th these beautiful festivals, but also the challenges and how our communities have been adapting to festivals uh, and being community online. Now, we have Rabbi David Rose with us of the Edinburgh Hebrew Congregation. Hello, David, welcome. Hello. Nice to have you with us. And we have the Right Reverend Dr. Martin Fair, the current moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Welcome, Martin. Hi, Ian. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, unlike Joe, I don't have a cup of tea there. I'm probably the only minister in the entire Christendom who doesn't drink, drink tea or coffee. So for me, uh, Adam's ale, uh, water <laughs> straight from the tap. And uh, here's to everybody. Lange yes. Cheers. So, so you're... You're possibly the most healthy moderator then that we've had on, is that? Well, uh, that may be stretching it, but uh, <laughs> either way, delighted to be joining you all today. And we're delighted to have you with us, as always. Now, the way that these shows always begin is that we, we share some positive news stories at the beginning. And I'm delighted to see that we have quite a few positive news stories this week. Some weeks we're scrambling around, but this week uh, it's great to have some good stories. First of all, the Glasgow Sikh Food Bank boss, uh, Shandeep Singh, was recognised um, just a couple of days ago, winning the Pride of Scotland Award after distributing 100,000 meals. And Shandeep has said that his work has taught him the strength of Glasgow's community. And I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, just that whole thing about us all being connected as community and looking out for one another, which is really what being people of faith should be about motivated to our acts of kindness um, and uh, we talked about this couple earlier on uh, this year but a husband and wife who run a Stennis Muir convenience store have been named as the winners of Good Morning Britain's Community Award. Jawad and Asiya Javed, owners of the Day to Day Express shop, uh, it's just been doing some wonderful things, handing out food parcels to those who are in, in, in most need uh, and uh, I even watched a video of them today in Good Morning Britain where they were saying, if you don't have food on Christmas Day, you know, this is a number you can phone, you can leave an anonymous uh, message if you like. And I just think it's a wonderful thing because to me, the, the message of Christmas, it goes beyond theology. It's, it's about kindness, compassion. It's about looking after those who are the most vulnerable in our society. And, and to know that this couple... Um, a Muslim couple at this time of year are really looking out for everybody. It's just fantastic. Uh, Ian, um, they're in Falkirk, aren't they? Yeah, they're based in Falkirk in uh, yeah. Stenhouse, New York. Yeah, Stenhouse. It's just that I felt that if somebody wanted to go along and maybe contribute to, towards that, they can perhaps go into the shop and make a donation of some kind because that's become a central point now, hasn't it? 
for donating. So if somebody wants to contribute, they can, and then they can pass it on to the relevant parties. Well, it might be good to to maybe contact them, maybe get them on the show at some point. And, yeah, definitely. Uh, see, see, see how we can help them. But uh, it's great that they've been recognised uh, in that way. Um, now, an another more light lighthearted story I wanted to mention is uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Now, I'm, I'm not always been someone who watches Strictly Come Dancing, but um, those of you who don't know this, this dance show, it was one this year by someone called Bill Bailey, who is age 55, a comedian. And th there's something about this that has transcended the show. It's being about, I mean, he talked in the end about the show must go on, was the, the music that he, 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 one of the main dances he won with. And he connected that to COVID. You know, we must go on, we must fight through uh, this, these difficult times. And I think the nation's really taken them to their hearts. They, and for me also, it's been about showing that age is just a number. You know, the old thing is you can't, you can't teach a dog an old dog new tricks, you know, is, is, is not true. They, they deliberately selected Bill thinking he was too old that people would laugh at him, he would go out in the early round, and then he obviously turned it around and proved proved everybody wrong. Uh, and I, I just think that that's, it's just such a positive thing to know that we can all, you know, we all have these gifts and abilities and, and we, we're we continually learning. Something I always like to think is that we learn to the day we die, to our last breath. Every day is a chance to learn something new. Um, and and uh, Joe, I know you're a very talented dancer. I don't know, did, did, did you tune into the, the Strictly or did you have thoughts on that? Well, no, it's just that I I think it's one of those television shows that brings the nation together, which is a very positive thing because there's so many forces trying to tear us apart. And it's just wonderful escapism to see all these people of different uh, gender, different sexual um, uh, background, different uh, age groups all coming together and doing something joyous so well done bill bailey i was thinking of you when i was watching bill dancing thinking if, if we were to have a, a an interfaith one we, we we would have to have you joe and i know you've i've watched some of your videos showing people some dance steps so we're, we're keeping this in mind if we have a future one only and, uh, only if uh, nasim is available as my partner Ooh. Yo, no, do you know how to do Bhangra? Yes. There we go. We're on. Okay. Oh, you know, you know what? Actually, I think I would pay to do that. I think we could sell that as a ticketed event. <laughs> Joe and the team doing Bhangra dancing. Uh, another story I'd like to move on to is uh, I thought this was such a lovely one. Was the Rushmore and District Muslim Association who sponsored a local Christmas tree and the sign of interfaith cooperation, cohesion, and support in their local area. Uh, and again, to me, that's something that embodies a true spirit of interfaith. Uh, uh, and one, again, talking about that meaning of Christmas, looking out for one another. Uh, often I've heard some people who come away with these statements saying, oh, we can't put up Christmas trees in our area because it will offend this faith group or that faith group. And, and this <coughs> is just an example that just shows all that. It's just ludicrous. We're actually, we, you know, as people of faith, we often quite, you know, we're happy to see the fact that one another is celebrating our festivals at that time of year. And we don't want to be seeing Christmas trees taken down or or Christmas being renamed the Winter Festival or, you know, other things being taken away. I think we quite proudly want to see faith in the public sphere and to see people having the freedom to express and, 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 and follow the faith. And so I think that was beautiful to see that Muslim group going out and sponsoring that Christmas tree. Um, now, does anybody else have any positive stories that they would like to share with us this week? Joe, please. Well, I, I have one that I'd like to share. The Edinburgh Interfaith Association is a member of the Scottish government's Faith and Communities Committee, which meets every <laughs> week to discuss some of the challenges and issues that faith communities are having during the pandemic. And a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that the Scottish government had created guidance around etiquette, how to behave civilly during the festive season when your relatives may want to do things like give you a hug or not wear a mask, how you can still maintain family and friendship, but do it in a polite manner. And so I said, let's take this one step further 
And let's create guidance around kindness and compassion. Because to me, the heart of every religious experience is to create in society greater kindness and compassion. And to my surprise, the civil servants invited the Edinburgh Interfaith Association to create guidance around kindness and compassion. And to my greater surprise, less than three days later, Nassim, they accepted our recommendations. And now I understand that the cabinet secretary for faith and communities is going to begin promoting kindness and compassion. And long may it last. Yes, I'm very hopeful that they're going to tweet out that uh, document um, once we upload it today, which is great. We all need more kindness and compassion. Martin, yes, please come in, moderator. I, I just wanted to comment further on, on what you were saying about, about the Christmas tree that had been put up. I, th I think this is really important. The media tries to spin this in a certain way. Uh, and for a good number of years now, there's been the story around, well, let's take out the name Christmas, let's call it Winterville, Winterfest, and so on. I've never once found any of that pushback coming from people of, of other faith groups. We've got a, a reasonably small secular elite that drives this agenda. And it's almost uh, anti-faith in general, if I can put it that way, rather than one way or another. And yet the media spins it as to be divisive between different faiths. It absolutely is not. As I say, I've never experienced that. I've always found uh, people from um, Jewish backgrounds, Islamic backgrounds, or wherever else are delighted that there are Christmas celebrations and, uh, and want to have a part in that, you know, uh, in their own ways. So let's just be absolutely clear about this. This is not about divisions between faith groups and those of us who have faith uh, are together on that. I'm convinced about that. I couldn't agree more on that, moderator. D um, Rabbi Rose is with us as well. D do you have any thoughts on that, uh, David? No, absolutely. I mean, when I go around, I always look for Christmas trees at this time of year in people's homes, because I think it's really nice and see what people do. Um, like I was in a taxi yesterday, I was looking out the window and you see um, who has trees and, and um, and I think this year it's even more important because it's really, people are going to have to struggle to meet their family and things like that. So it's more important to have a symbol of, of doing things. Um, um, I mean, in some ways it's interesting, like for the Jewish community on Hanukkah, I think the idea of candle lighting, even by Zoom, but that idea of, of joining together for a candle lighting in different people's homes, um, like virtually, was really important because people couldn't meet for other things. And I think these symbols become more important in a time when, when um, you can't do other things. Thank you very much. And I, and I think that leads us in really nicely to, Joe, I think you're going to um, lead us into a little video around uh, how Hanukkah was celebrated or some of the things that were done online before we uh, invite uh, David Rose to share some more reflections. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Rabbi Rose, about your comment regarding the virtual Hanukkah blessings that we orchestrated this year on behalf of the Jewish community of Edinburgh through the resources of the Edinburgh Jewish Cultural Center. We invited eight different families, including the chairman of Edinburgh Hebrew Congregation, the rabbi of Sakat Shalom, uh, the liberal congregation, here in Edinburgh and six other families to light their candle and share with us their traditions online. And these videos receive thousands and thousands of views from all over the world. And now to introduce Rabbi Rose's uh, interview with Ian today, we wanna share one of these videos with you. This is my friend, uh, Jika Loning, who is uh, lighting candles and playing the uh, violin whilst her family sings the traditional Hanukkah song, Maltzor. And so from the Jewish community of Edinburgh to all of our friends, happy Hanukkah. Baruch atah Eloheinu melech haolam. 
השת קדישנו במצוותיו וציוונו להדליק נר של חנוכה. wonderful to see that Joe and um, now I, uh, I believe Nassim is, is going to ask one or two questions of, of, of um, Rabbi David Rose. So Rabbi David Rose um, again just let people know is the, the Rabbi of the Edinburgh Hebrew Congregation and also an honorary president of the Edinburgh Interfaith Association so it's wonderful to have him with us uh, to talk about festivals and, and how the community has been adapting recently. Over to you Nassim. Hello David good to see you again you okay? To see you, yes, how are you? Um, well, alhamdulillah. Um, just before we start, uh, that video was really interesting. I saw there was um, some rolls lying in front on, on the table. Is that the traditional food that's eaten on uh, Hanukkah? I don't think there are rolls, there were donuts. Oh. So on Hanukkah, we have things that were um, are, uh, made in oil. So we have donuts and what Nancy, Joe's wife, was showing to how to make potato latkes. Very unhealthy festival, so I'm very glad this week that um, I, I have one donut left, but no latkes left, <laughs> and that's enough for me, and I need to walk more, so, yeah, um, yeah. so um, that's what they are. Right, so just to get a bit of background, so what exactly, how is Hanukkah celebrated, because I know that's a massive festival uh, within the Jewish uh, faith, um, just for the benefit of, of people that don't really know what goes on. Maybe you could give us a bit of background on that. Yeah, I mean, Hanukkah is, I mean, Hanukkah is a late festival. It's, a, it's a, the last, you know, um, and, and celebrates a war of liberation of Jews against the Greeks. I mean, if one wants to be politically correct, you say it's the uh, anti-colonialist war um, in Israel in uh, 2000 years ago, and um, the Jews won. And, um, and so that's the basic story of Hanukkah. It's also a story of, of lighting one lights and, and one cruise of oil that lasted for eight days. So there are various reasons why we have Hanukkah eight days. Um, and that's why we have food and oil. But the main thing about Hanukkah is lighting candles. So it's, it's quite a weekday festival. There aren't really, um, you know, there's no prohibition of work. There aren't really big meals that people have, like on the Sabbath or other festivals or in the synagogue. But what you do have is lighting candles, which mm -hmm. is very, um, uh, and, and on the first night you light one candle and on each consecutive night you light one more candle to get to eight candles. Mm -hmm. And that's a basic, um, those are the basic practices of the festival. As you saw, I think they were lighting the seventh light, uh, unless you forgot to light one, but I think they were lighting the seventh light. Um, Gika, so yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, within the, uh, the Muslim faith, you're, you're aware of Ramadan. So during pandemic, Ramadan was spent very much at home. No, you know, because traditionally we go to the mosque for special prayers, we go there for open our fast. So obviously this year, everything's been done at home with just your own family members. So obviously, uh, you know, we've missed out with going to the masjid, seeing friends and meeting up with family. How has this affected the Jewish faith, the pandemic, going to the synagogue? Or, I mean, is it like the Muslim faith, very much about community? Or have you been able to, how have you adapted that? Well, it's both community and family. So again, Hanukkah was easy in some ways because it's often about lighting candles. We could have a service last week, uh, but again, the services are not the main thing. I mean, the real <clears throat> interesting thing was the two major festivals of the Jewish year. So it was Passover, which was in total lockdown in April, and then people just managed. So we had to 
create things that people could do, to do at home, uh, which is you have the home service anyway, but even for myself, it's the first time in my life I've ever done it by myself. Uh, so I know what to do, but I, I, I made various types of services people could do, you know, how long they wanted to be, there were two nights. So, so that's the type of thing we did. And the High Holy Days, which are very much in September, very much um, connected to the synagogue and synagogue services. So we just had to have different, like, um, staggered services, if you like. So we, we had more, you know, the one on Yom Kippur, we had three or four services rather than just one long service throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people had to book to come and, and we did things like that. And we also, for all the festivals, sent out um, gifts um, to the whole community. So everyone from the community got a package uh, mm -hmm. of different things to get connected to that festival. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a way we're trying to, uh, and at the moment, unfortunately, we have decided because of the, what's going on right at the moment to actually close the synagogue. Um, we're going to review it, but to close the synagogue, even though we can theoretically have it open for 20 people. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, again, we're discussing how we can keep in touch with people. Yeah. I mean, the safety is, is, is paramount because obviously Nicholas Durgeon's announcement a couple of days ago with this new variant of, yeah. the, of, of the of coronavirus has taken it to a next level um, in so much that my aunt was actually due to fly back to Pakistan today. So we're busy packing whatnot. And we got a, a, an email last night to say that the Pakistan has closed its borders to no, nobody's allowed to enter Pakistan. And so, you know, she's she was due to fly in about half an hour. So she's sitting next door, sulking for home. She was going to go home today. But, uh, you know, safety is paramount. So and with them, uh, a lot of mustards have also decided to close. But because the numbers are so low, mm -hmm. like, for example, 20 of the uh, numbers that are allowed to visit the mosque, it's just like, you know, you sometimes wonder, is it even worth it? You know, but, uh, you know, in our own homes, in our hearts, we have God. And that's, you know, that that is a, a, is a real blessing. And no matter where we are, we can, uh, you know, speak to our neighbors, interact with the neighbors, our friends and family via Zoom. We're very, very blessed. We're in, in some ways, we are very blessed. But obviously, there are people out there that are lonely and, and isolated. You know, we pray for them during difficult times. Mm. Thank you, David. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're, we're working as the people who are not on Zoom, because we have Zoom service and we don't, we don't use technology on, on the Sabbath, but we have Zoom service on a Friday, uh, on Saturday night, which is a nice ceremony with candles and spices. So we have something called Havdallah services on Saturday night. We always have a fun video. We had um, for Hanukkah, the Bohemian Rhapsody, Moat Sur. Uh, Hanukkah song, which was absolutely brilliant. And Hillary, who was, took part in Joe's thing, actually had her whole family there from four, three different continents, four, four, yeah, four different continents or three different Wonderful. continents. And it was really quite fascinating and lots of people. So that was a lot of fun, but there are people that either can't or won't get on the Zoom. So how do we keep in contact with them, especially if the synagogues is closed um, for the next few weeks? Joe, did you want to comment? Yes, I was just wondering, Rabbi Rose, during this terrible period that we're experiencing of the pandemic, how does a rabbi, or in the case of the Right Reverend Martin Fair, um, a uh, Christian minister, provide spiritual counseling for the members of your community? And what kinds of issues are arising that have been different before the pandemic among the members of your community? So. How is that role changing and evolving? Um, I would say we do a lot more on telephone, um, but it's a lot of loneliness, which you do, even among people that have family. Um, and, and so I um, ha have met people in coffee shops, which obviously is going to stop from this weekend, um, but I have met people in coffee shops, uh, which is a way of meeting people. Uh, simply because they need that human contact. Um, I haven't had, we, I'm mean, lucky. I think our community has been relatively lucky. Um, we don't have an old age home in Edinburgh. They do in Glasgow and they were quite badly affected <coughs> with a lot of deaths, unfortunately, in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and we have a fantastic welfare committee that we have a buddy system, which we're now going to reactivate on a more active way um, of ringing people once a week and that each person in the community has a buddy from the welfare committee that rings them. 
Uh, and if someone wants to speak to the rabbi, they speak to the rabbi. I ring people on various important occasions. If I know they have a birthday or the anniversary of a parent's death or something, I'll ring them. Um, so I've been quite busy, which I, I feel grateful for. Um, I think we're, uh, as ministers, I, I, I don't know what the moderator thinks. I think as ministers, we are quite lucky in that we're busy and we have jobs and we have important things to do. Uh, and a lot of people are sitting around at home and wondering what's going to be. So I think in that way we're quite lucky and should be grateful. Could I just ask one follow-up question? Rabbi Rose, during the uh, pandemic, I'm sure some of the content of sermons might change as well, drawing upon the current affairs, the current issues that are happening. What reflections might come from the Torah, from the Jewish Old Testament that inform sermons today that help people to understand this terrible time that we are experiencing? Oh, that's a difficult question. And I've used several things. Um, and of course, now I can't remember them. <laughs> I mean, I did, I did do one thing on the, on the candles and that we go, you know, there was an argument whether you should go down from eight or up from one. And that, that with the pandemic, we've been going down because we've, you know, do you get rid of the evil or do you create the light? Mm -hmm. So at the moment we were having to get rid of the evil, but now with the vaccine, hopefully we can start to create light. Um, but I did say something on Joseph and his brothers, which I've forgotten what I said last week, so I must be getting old. But if I remember it all, uh, but I have been saying, trying to use very things. But on the other hand, I'm sure the moderator will also that um, you don't want sometimes to just talk about the pandemic because people are sick of it. So you need to talk about other things sometimes as well. Thank you. Yeah, I would, uh, I would mm -hmm. heartily agree with everything that Rabbi Rose has just said. It's a perfect example of how we share so much in common. And uh, he talked about uh, the use of the phone. And uh, we've done so much of that. You, you know, we've got all the new technology. I mean, hands up if you'd heard of Zoom before February of this year, very few people. Now it's, uh, it's just our second nature. But alongside the new technology, the, the old technology has its place. And we don't always want to be face to face on screen. And so uh, personally, I have made hundreds, and, and, and I mean hundreds and hundreds of pastoral phone calls. Um, and the truth of the matter is, Joe, that I think I've done more pastoral work in lockdown than I would have done ordinarily speaking. Wow. Um, and the time has been there to do it because the, the work of a parish minister would include so many things that have not been possible. So take chaplaincy in schools. Now, throughout when March through June, schools were closed. So we were not doing that. Our life seems to take up so many meetings, you know, thank God if we're not going to have to do so many meetings in times to come. But more, a lot of those meetings didn't happen. Uh, and a wee lesson was learned. Life went on without them. But the point was there was more time freed up. So I gave myself to that pastoral work, phoning people, particularly those who I believed would be somewhat isolated. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how people were willing and ready to open up honestly on the phone. Interestingly, maybe even more so than if you're face to face, there's something about the distance or I'm not having quite to look at you in the eye, but I can tell you this right now. And the honesty that came through the pastor work was for me, very humbling that people were ready to share with me, uh, to download what was in their hearts and their anxieties with me. So the pastor work has come into its own, I would say. There are still times when you miss being in the same room with people, but we've not been, we've not been blocked, that's for sure. A moderator, has your church been open? It has been, um, not obviously through the early days of the pandemic, and, and we didn't rush to open in, in July when it first became possible. Our key, and I think um, Nassim talked about this just moments ago in relation to our aunt, our key thing was how do we keep the community safe? 
And for me, that, you know, that was our, our primary motivation. At that time, without getting political about this, but around about that time, I remember President Trump and, and others were saying, uh, getting the churches open is absolutely vital. There's a, a, a Christian um, activist, can, let me call him that, from the United States, uh, Shane Claiborne. Maybe some of you have come across Shane. He works out of a monastic community, really, in Philadelphia. Uh, very inspiring guy. He responded to President Trump's uh, entreaties by saying, actually, let's have the churches be the last places to open because we are so concerned about the well-being of our people because we love one another to the extent that we will not risk one another's health. So many churches did not rush to open. Those that did were very careful about it. My own church opened in October uh, and has worked within the restrictions ever since then. And, uh, and here we are again, lockdown tier four uh, is gonna change all that again. We've got to be resilient. Uh, we've got to be creative and absolutely we've got to believe it's very homespun theology, but it's true, we will get through this. Thank you. Thank you for that, moderator. Um, Nassim, I, I believe you have a video. Do you want to introduce to us, going back to the more positive message uh, <laughs> yeah. of Christmas, I think, in, in Pakistan, is it? That's correct. I mean, um, when I was quite young, I heard that uh, in Pakistan, there were quite a few uh, Christians that celebrated Christmas. And that, to me, came as a bit of a shock, because if you think of Pakistan as a, a Muslim country celebrating Eid and Ramadan, but there's quite a majority uh, of, most, of Christians in Pakistan that celebrate Christmas, obviously. So the video that Carrie is, is, is going to play is, is depicts that. It's great because it's the only one I could find in English because the rest of them were in Urdu. So, but this is really kind of, it, it, it's the message of how Christmas is celebrated in Pakistan. For Christians, the 25th of December marks the birth of Jesus Christ, the messenger of love and peace. People wearing fancy attires can be seen going to family feasts, distributing sweets and decorating, most importantly, the Christmas tree. Colourful lights adorn the exterior of buildings, streets, homes and churches to liven up the spirit of the day. Like other parts of the country, Christian community in Karachi is also celebrating Christmas with great joy. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year! And a happy new year. Who are in Kayumabad, large number of people went to churches to attend the midnight services. They sang a number of Christmas carols and thanked God for his blessings. The Christmas was very meaningful for me in my life because the, on the Christmas time, the the uh, the Savior, the, the Jesus Christ, who uh, sacrificed his life because of us, he born on this time, and uh, we celebrate this, this like as you celebrate your Eid and uh, uh, Hindus uh, celebrate uh, Diwali like this. Christmas gives a message of peace and love. And that is why Christmas celebrations are not limited to Christians only. Muslims also celebrate this day with their Christian brothers and share their joy. According to Muslim belief, they also believe in Jesus Christ as Isa So this Christmas is not only for Christians, this is uh, a festival for the whole of the community, Christians and Muslims as well, because they also believe in that. As far as celebrations are concerned, we are free to celebrate Christmas. Whatever celebrations we have, we have no problem. The Christian community are doubly elated on this day, as 25th of December also marks the birth anniversary of the father of the nation, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who gave them a homeland where they are enjoying rights guaranteed under the constitution and are able to practice their belief without any pressure. 
According to the Christian community living in Karachi, they believe that today is the day they were gifted with the greatest gift of all humanity and that to honor that gift, they gave out the message of love, peace and joy. Emma Jung, Express 24-7. Wonderful. Wonderful. That was really a beautiful video, Miss Stephen. Thank you. Joe. And I have a question for our two guests, if I may. Rabbi Rose and moderator, you may have seen on the internet this cute little cartoon of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus in the manger. And out with the door are the three wise men. And Joseph turns to the three wise men and says, Don't come in. You're not in our bubble. <laughs> <laughs> what lessons do you think we can learn from the stories of Christmas, Hanukkah, the Judeo-Christian friendship relationship that goes back thousands of years, uh, that you could pass on to future ministers who may a hundred years from now find themselves in your shoes having to deal with a pandemic in this or another community? What lessons can we learn from this experience we've had. Let me just say, say something straight away. And I'm answering your question, hopefully, and also responding to what Rabbi Rose said earlier in relation to Hanukkah. Uh, he said, I think if I'm right, that it is largely a home festival as opposed to something that would be celebrated in services at the synagogue. Now, I think the Christian community has a lot to learn from that. Of course, you can think of nurturing your, your Christian faith at home, and many will do that. There will be a personal aspect to their, um, to their faith journey. But we do not do enough of what I would call those family occasions. Uh, and by the look of what I've seen around about Hanukkah, the video we saw today and others that I've watched, it absolutely is around the table. Um, maybe similarly, um, Seder meal and so on, families around the table. I think the Christian community has something to recover in that regard. And possibly the pandemic has taught us that. We maybe are too dependent on our Sunday gatherings, our community gatherings. Now, I don't want to downplay them. There's nothing better than the community coming together. But what when that's not possible? How do we sustain our faith together? We need to recover something of the round the kitchen table spirituality. And um, I think we have done that and we will need that to sustain us. You said, Joe, maybe there's another pandemic. I think, did you say a hundred years? Um, the, the scientists say that every hundred years there is a pandemic, so to speak. Exactly. The only thing I think is that I think they're going to become more frequent, and that's all to do with just the fragility of the ecosystem and so on. So it might be we're tackling more of those things. And so the lessons we're learning now, absolutely, we will pass to, pass to those who come after us. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I'm um, actually thinking of writing a um, series of questions for the Board of Management on the pandemic. Uh, and what we've learned. I don't, I don't want to give them answers. I think I want to get them to start thinking uh, rather than me giving them answers of, of what it means for the future. Once we're out of this, which hopefully we will be in, near by this time next year, hopefully, uh, at least. Um, and, and one of the lessons is about buildings and people. And, you know, our building has been closed. We've used it, you know, and normally it was quite busy. We use it on various occasions during the week. Once, you know, since March, we've used it when it's been open once a week, maybe twice a week, uh, or for collection for things. How do we use buildings and how important are they? Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, um, you know, is not what we've realized that the community, as I've been saying for a long time, the community is people, not buildings. Mm -hmm. and, and too many institutions, and I'm sure the moderator knows about this from his experience with the Church of Scotland, but too many institutions have lots of buildings and they concentrate on infrastructure. But actually what makes communities of people, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons that we've learned from this. And I think we need to use that lesson going forward when we decide what our future is gonna be. Um, the importance of people and concentrate on people rather than buildings yeah. or infrastructure. 
Well, let me just um, echo that absolutely. The, the, the general trustees within our uh, denomination who have responsibility for the buildings, they have a goal, um, an ideal situation. We would lose nearly half our buildings. Um, we carry too much um, bricks and mortar. And often as not, they are a millstone around the necks of local people who are constantly having to find the funds to maintain buildings, to fix the leak in the roof and so on. And all of that distracts them from the mission of the church, which is, well, what we've talked about. It's the engagement with communities. It's serving the world. So we need to find ways that are not building dependent. We have a congregation in Aberdeen that was started, planted would be the phrase we use, maybe about 15 years ago. And they were determined from the beginning not to have a building. So they used the school, they used the community centre, they used wherever. And many times through the years, the church has said to them, now that you're established, shouldn't you be thinking about a building? And they've said, no, we don't want a building. We want to be free from those responsibilities to be the community of God's people and to focus on our mission. We don't think we need a building to further those aims. Now, listen, it's a cold and wet country, so we can't do without some buildings, but we definitely have too many. And we've survived without our buildings through much of this year. There's a lesson if ever there was yeah. one. And one of the, um, the interesting things I found with working with um, knowing the, the liberal community in, in, um, in Edinburgh, as far as I understand, they, 15 years ago, I can't remember when it was, actually had to make a decision what we put our resources in. Do we put our resources into getting a rabbi or do our resources are getting a building? And they decided, obviously being a rabbi, that they made the right decision. The important thing is to have a rabbi and not a building. And um, I think everyone, I think Joe, you would agree that that was the right decision. Mm. Indeed. Right. Um, very insightful just hearing about uh, how our communities have been adapting. And I think what, what we're partly learning is the importance of community uh, getting getting too attached uh, to our buildings and maybe a routine of the way things have always been. Um, it does make me think, moderator, what you've had over the last year uh, must have been very unique for a moderator. Uh, I don't know the, the the last moderator that's had to uh, had to deal with anything quite on 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 this level. Maybe we are going back a hundred years. Um, or perhaps during the war, maybe there, there have been instances where moderators had to, 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 to adapt. How, how challenging has, has it been and what, what has that meant to you as, as a moderator? Uh, seemingly there would have been a plan for you coming in to place and a whole diary marked out for a whole year. And then at some point, uh, plan B had to come into operation, I'm guessing. Pretty well, 23rd of March 2020, that was when Plan B started, I think, when lockdown came in. Um, for your interest, Ian, and, and for those who are watching the broadcast, my year started off completely differently with the cancellation of our General Assembly. That is the high point when the church comes together. Let me tell you, that was the first time it had been cancelled since 1689. Okay, 1689. So do the arithmetic. And th think about what's happened in that time we've had um, in the 17th century with Jacobite uprisings, <laughs> the 18th, in the 1800s, Napoleonic Wars in the 20th century earlier, uh, World Wars, uh, Spanish flus, everything. And the General Assembly was not cancelled once until COVID came along. So, that, I mean, that really does put it in perspective. It certainly does. And, and what it's meant for me is that everything that was in my diary, and I, I don't mean most, I mean everything um, that was in my diary, whew, scrapped. And it's all gone online pretty well. And I've ha had to find new ways to communicate. The role of the moderator is not the decision maker for the church. Let's be quite clear about that. Um, I'm more as an ambassador or a spokesperson. I articulate the policy and the belief of the church rather than deciding it. So I've had to find new, uh, new ways, different ways to communicate. 
that's been a challenge, no doubt about it, but I am glad in, uh, for various things. Number one, I am not new to the digital world. In my own congregation, we've been live streaming worship, for example, for about six years. Uh, I have been very involved in social media for many years. And there are other moderators whose skill set was different, but who would have struggled to come into this year because mm. they would have been, you know, a very, a, a very low starting point. So I thank God in his providence that somehow it worked out like this. But let me say a positive. You, you were right, Ian. Normally, the moderator inherits a diary that is probably 80% already complete, and you're going to do this, you're going to do that, because that's just in the diary. I'm the first moderator, probably in living memory, who, in effect, has had a blank piece of paper. And there's something about that that appeals to me, that you get to make it up rather than just doing what's always been done. So I think I've thrived with the creative options to think, well, how can I do this? One of, the, one of the online things I did, for example, and will continue to do, uh, a digital conversation series called It's a Fair Question. I apologize right now for the horrible pun, fair <laughs> question, Martin <laughs> Fair. But yeah, that um, notwithstanding, those programs have gone out and you know were viewed 10, 15,000 times. Fantastic. Uh, so it's been a great creative uh, door has mm. opened while other doors closed. And uh, it's been exciting going through those new doors and trying to make the most of the situation. I believe you even did a, a, a off the ball episode with one of the the the, the football uh, phone-in shows. So you, you certainly have been creative during this time. Huh? Well, to be honest with you, that was a, a lifetime ambition almost. Uh, for those in the football fraternity, off the ball goes out every Saturday, football chat show and as a, 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 a very avid football supporter I mean I listen to that program all the time I would have loved to be on it and then moderator hmm, I wonder if they would have me as a guest so we reached out to them and they said sure come on and um, you know just to be slightly more serious about it for a moment about that yeah. I think if you ask the ordinary person who really doesn't know much about faith communities or certainly about church and what Christian faith's all about. I think they would come up with a, a rather stuffy image and a perception that I think needs constantly challenged. And so I'm always looking for ways to show that, of course, as a person of faith, one uh, is following a certain direction in life, but it doesn't mean we're not ordinary folk who enjoy football, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or who dance. Uh, I'm not the greatest Strictly fan, but I was watching it because one of my predecessors, John Chalmers, moderator in 2014, I think, John, his son, JJ Chalmers, was a participant on the show. Yeah. Uh, following his, um, well, he was um, badly injured in Afghanistan. Yeah. That's his backstory. He's now become a TV presenter. And there he was on Strictly. So you see my point. Mm. We to be constantly showing actually Christians, people of various faiths, were actually ordinary folk at the same time. And, you know, I tried to put that over by, and off the ball was part of that. Yeah, it, it, it takes your, your message to, to, to a wider audience, which is great, as you say. And we've talked a little bit about the, 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 the challenges this year. And uh, Joe was asking that question earlier about how do we, how do we keep positive during this time? Are there pieces of scripture, are there things that you go to that, that, that give you solace at this time? Well, I mean, I could, I could start with the, with the Gospel of John and, and the first chapter where we read, uh, you know, the word was made flesh as we interpret that Jesus coming into the world. And we read, of course, John has an emphasis on light and darkness. And right there in the first chapter, we read that the darkness has never extinguished the light. Um, and that absolutely we hang on to. It has been a dark period. Ask about mental health, for example, across the nation, and you will hear incidences and so on have, have risen uh, worryingly so. So the message that light trumps darkness, that love trumps hate, that life trumps death, all of that is in the gospel and so is 
powerfully important at this time. But let me also draw in the Hebrew scriptures and for one of my, by far and away, one of my favorite passages in the whole of our Bible, uh, the prophet Isaiah and the 43rd chapter. We read that um, the Lord says, you know, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. And then the prophet goes on to say this, Though you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Though the fire is raging all about, uh, all around you, I will be with you. And of course, though you are exiled, I will be with you. Now, this is absolutely crucial. People of faith are not exempt from the trials of life. Mm -hmm. We don't get a, a get out of jail free card from COVID, from illness, from unemployment, from whatever the challenges of life are. We are in the world as much as anybody. But we have from God this cast iron assurance. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, and these are the metaphors, the deep waters, the, the fire raging, I will be with you. Now that for me is the bedrock of my faith and I, want, I would want to share that with folks far and wide. And of course, for Christians, that I will be with you, but comes to its, com its culmination, its completeness at Christmas. Incarnation, Emmanuel, God declaring, I am with you. Mm -hmm. That is the message of faith I would want to share with people at this time. That's, that's very, very beautiful put and very uplifting. Sorry, Joe, do you want to come in? I just have one final question. For our honorary president, Rabbi Rose has had many, many years of experience with interfaith relations. What do you think, Rabbi Rose, has happened in terms of positives regarding interfaith relations in the city of Edinburgh during this pandemic? Is that a lesson we can, we can take away, a positive lesson from this? Um, I mean, I think that, um, first of all, we are lucky to have Ian. Uh, who has done a fantastic job uh, while looking after a family also. And, and uh, it's not, I believe there's another bit of family coming along as well. So that's also yes, something to look forward to. Indeed. Um, and, and I think that with the way we've had these type of things that, that, that people have joined together, the way that you arrange something for Rabbi Sachs, the way that um, we have kind of shared our experiences uh, and, and, you know, when I've been, I have um, uh, the moderator, I know Scott McKenna, many of you know, who is now an heir, but I keep in contact with him uh, and see what's going on in his church, which has not been so simple, you know, because um, he has one of the largest uh, churches in Scotland and what's been, and they've been in level four for a while and how, you know, and, and sharing that sort of thing, what's going on. Um, but there's a wonderful, actually, interfaith thing that during lockdown, so um, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I'm sad that the synagogue is closed again, but it means I have a, um, as the chief rabbi said during lockdown, it means he has Saturday mornings off. Uh, so you can actually go for a Shabbat walk uh, in the morning, especially now in the winter. Uh, but during the spring, which was a lovely spring, I was going for one of my Shabbat morning walks after praying the morning service. And, um, I, in my street, there's a lady sitting outside in her little garden uh, reading the Quran, a uh, Muslim lady. And that was just absolutely wonderful. And it's something I, I remember. And that kind of interfaith thing that, that, um, that we have in our city, which is actually interfaith together. It's not making a program. It is people living their faith uh, in, in the midst of a pandemic. And I, I thought that was a, just a wonderful um, example of that. Thank you. Thank you, David. And Martin, uh, moderator, one last question. Um, how different will be Christmas for you this year? How will you be celebrating Christmas? It will be different. And uh, again, as Rabbi Rose has, has indicated, uh, <laughs> the Sunday morning's off. <laughs> it's made weekends very different, that's for sure. And so on Christmas Day, um, ordinarily, we would have a whole family church celebration in church on, on Christmas morning not happening this year. Um, the night before on Christmas Eve, we usually have very much an all age family celebration. Um, we have nativity and uh, a Christingo procession. 
there's maybe not enough time to, to explain the Christingo, but it's an, an, a very long tradition. Um, Cancelled. Um, we're going to do things on Zoom, but it will not be the same, that's for sure. And in terms of family, um, for me, family, Christmas Day has always been just about as many people as physically could fit around that table as was possible. This year is going to be myself, um, my wife, and our two sons who are still at home. Our third son uh, lives in Australia now. And the grandparents, the brothers, sister-in-laws, no, all in their own homes. So we will feel that. We really will feel them as, of course, we'll be on the phone, we'll be on FaceTime. But um, much as I love and appreciate the technology, take, take for instance, you know, my oldest son in Australia, are we going to miss him not being at our table? Absolutely we are. So there'll be sadness mixed with the happiness. But as I said earlier, I think I did anyway, you talked to so many things at the moment. <laughs> Um, we are going forward believing that we will come through this and that 2021, although the early parts are going to be rough, no question about that, the vaccine rollout is going to make a difference. We are going to be reunited with people in 2021. So the light uh, shines, will continue to do so despite the restrictions this Christmas. Thank you very much. We wish you a very Merry Christmas when it comes. Okay. Um, does anyone have any final uh, comments just before we're going to close with a song very soon? Does anyone have anything they want to share with us? No? Yes, Martin, please. Well, I mean, in the very simplest way, may I say this on behalf of, of the Christian community, if I can be so bold as to include uh, the wholeness of, of that, we very much value and appreciate our relationships that we are fostering and building, I think, strengthening in these days, and your expressions of Happy Christmas uh, coming in our direction are very much appreciated and valued. Through the year, um, I've taken opportunity through my social media to wish the Jewish community, for example, uh, Happy Hanukkah, and to wish my Muslim brothers and sisters uh, the very best on their celebrations. So to have that coming back at Christmas time, it means a lot. I'm very thankful to you. Well, I'm sure that's much uh, reciprocated. Thank you very much. Um, so just to say, just before we end, um, next week we have pre-recorded a, a, a wonderful show with Firim Sarah Illouen, um, fantastic French academic, um, looking at the whole thing of religious freedom in France. It is uh, an explosive, fascinating show. Just tune into that if you, you get an opportunity. And then during January, we'll be looking at some of the best bits of the last uh, year. So many wonderful guests and shows. Yeah, no, I had. hope there's no bloopers. Uh, no bloopers, no bloopers. <laughs> no bloopers, please. We, could, we couldn't find enough to, to fill up the show. <laughs> I don't think so. I think I think we could fill up about ten hours of bloopers, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm, I'm uh, I think I'll need to blackmail you not to release some of the some of the bloopers videos on YouTube. <laughs> That's for another time, the same. Um, anyway, people, um, we're just going to come to uh, an end just in a second. Um, for those celebrating, just have a wonderful Christmas and a great time, certainly for all of us to be with family. Um, we're saying to Nassim and Joe before we came on there. They have chosen to play a, a track of, of mine, which is a gospel song that I recorded a few years ago called A Little More of, of Jesus' Love. But this song is really about the Christmas message, about being kind to one another and remembering those who are less fortunate than you. So we're just about to play out with that song. And just to say to everybody, stay safe uh, and uh, keep the faith. Thank you. Amen. When did we forget how to love one another? When did we learn to turn 
our backs on each other What the world needs more of Is a little more of Jesus' love Oh, a little more of Jesus' love Is what we need, we need to lift us up Oh, a little more of Jesus' love Can bring hope at night To shine through the fear I hope for peace at special time of year that we can spread throughout the air. Sometimes the world can be a dark and lonely place, and it's hard to find a friendly face. While the world needs more, is a little more of Jesus' love. Jesus love you will never be alone with Jesus love there's no need to stay at home while the world needs more is a little more of Jesus love oh, a little more of Jesus love is why we Christmas, the world feels at one. We must remember when a child was born. Not to need our prayers, people everywhere. For what the world needs more of oh, is a little more of Jesus' love. At Christmas, the world feels at one. We must remember when a child. Thank you very much, everybody. That was fun. What a fantastic video, Ian.